Hello, everyone, and welcome to our sixth installment of our Trade Centric University Masterclass Series Integrating B2B Connective Commerce into your Omni Channel Strategy. Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items for the session. As a reminder, you will be on mute for the duration of the session. We will have a Q&A session at the end. Please submit your questions in the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen, and we will do our best to answer your question. If we don't get to your question during the webinar, a trade-centric representative will reach out to provide an answer. Today, our host is Kevin Kazemeyer, Head of Channel Development at TradeCentric. He'll be joined by Paul DeForno, Managing Director, Commerce Practice at Deloitte Digital. In this session, you will gain insights from real life examples illustrating the impact and potential of B2B connective commerce and explore best practices for implementation to ensure the successful adoption of its approach. And now I will pass it over to our co-host, Kevin Kazemeyer. Thank you, Melissa, and uh, welcome everyone to our latest masterclass series, uh, Integrating B2B Commerce into your Omnichannel Strategy. I'm excited today to dive into this, this, this strategy because, you know, we're going to be spending some time looking at how to approach it, as well as the tips and tricks necessary to successfully incorporate connecting your commerce to your customer's e-procurement system as a pillar of that strategy. And I'm really excited today to be joined by Paul DeForno and like to welcome you, Paul, to our session. And why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and help kick us off by setting the context for today's call. Sounds good. Thanks. Excited to be on air too. One of my favorite topics, talking about B2B commerce. I lead up the B2B commerce practice at Deloitte Digital. Um, we're the largest commerce practice agency in the world. And I I've worked with some of the largest B2B companies over the last uh, number of years. And today, really want to help, one, make sure people understand kind of the basics, because a lot of the challenges that we have is just semantics, or people don't understand some of the terms. And so we're going to start off with just the basic terms to baseline everybody, and then get into, yeah, and, and if, if I would start from the basics, like one of the biggest challenges that I've found is many times, People use terms interchangeably and don't really understand what the opportunity is. And that's our first challenge. And so when we talk about B2B commerce, you let's look back and understand B2B sales. So at the simplest way, it's a business seller selling to another business customer. That's that's what traditional sales has been for so long. But if you look at many of these B2B sales, it's in commerce. So if people come to you and say, hey, we're just doing B2C commerce and B2B is just similar. Well, it's not. And here's a great example. And I like to use this, this visual just to get the point across. You're not just selling to one person, right? You're selling to potentially a committee, sales manager, sales representative, field sales. There's a lot of different personas and people that you have to interact with. And so when you're thinking about the tools and what, what are the tools to enable that sell? You have to think about all the multifaceted ways to help in that sales process, which in the past has been, you know, very manual and in many, in many industries still very manual. And, and so when we talk about B2B commerce, what we've now started to talk about, next slide, is Think about B2B commerce in an omni-channel way. And omni-channel B2B commerce, and this is the way Deloitte thinks about that, covers the full differentiated end-to-end -end digital sales experience across all the channels that empowers company to effectively serve their customers. Okay, so if we jump to the next slide. And what I mean by omni-channel, so in many times I'm having discussions with some of the uh, some of these companies and they think of commerce as just this other thing off to the side and it's a very narrow thing. But actually, when we talk about B2B commerce and I'm forcing it to go talk about in an omni-channel, and this is much the same path that 15 years ago that B2C also had to go through, is it's actually omni-channel. It's not just the, the direct e-commerce website and the mobile apps off of that, but it's also 
the call center reps, enabling them and letting them being able to order. It's also marketplaces, your marketplace, third-party marketplaces. It's dealer network sales. There's chat. And, and so there's so many different ways to connect all of this. And, and the area that we're going to double click down on is around e-procurement as one of these, um, well, not fully understood and the awareness out there for the massive opportunity that there is around e-procurement. So as part of this omni-channel. So Kevin, do you want to maybe talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. And it's, it's great, right? So you think about that and, and what we see too is that that's a commonly overlooked area, right? So I have this whole strategy and yet I don't understand that there's this, this segment of e-commerce customers that we kind of call connected commerce. So what really is connected commerce? Well, I think in a nutshell, it's, it's basically when you've successfully built and launched that commerce platform and now you've layered on top of it the ability to support e-procurement system capabilities like punching out, having someone shop your, your commerce catalog, and then being able to take a, an order electronically. So receiving electronic purchase orders, sending electronic invoices, and then other documents like order acknowledgements and advanced ship notices. These are basically, you know, you're automating the entire procure to pay process. And you know, at that point, you have access not only to connect to your customers, but to all the major e-procurement platforms out there on the market today. And so really that connected commerce piece allows you to really go further with your total omni-channel strategy. Now, when you think about that and you look at the market, right? E-commerce maturity, it, it varies and, you know, We've kind of laid the groundwork for for where the the market is, but when you think about it, um, there's been a lot of talk about are we in a downturn? Is there a pending recession? Whatever you want to call it, right? And that e-commerce and digital sales that they were suffering. Well, we conducted a study recently um, with you know 150 companies, and this is what we're seeing, right? We partnered with DC360, and we're finding that nearly 90% of these companies have reported e-commerce revenue growth over the past year. So as much as you know, we may think that it's flat or down, there's growth out there and there's even more growth to be had when you start to think about layering in that connected commerce experience. So to further double click on that, and Paul, I wanna bring you in on this one. <clears throat> think about in this study, we also started talking about e-commerce maturity and you're gonna see that e-commerce e maturity varies throughout the, the the market segment that we we uh, solicited and you know you look at this most companies are showing up that they're only halfway through their maturity journey when it comes to truly being a, a digital connected organization right and so some companies they seem satisfied they launched a commerce site they may have some traditional edi capabilities that they're happy leveraging and connecting to but there's still more room to grow, right? There's more opportunity out there. And so you don't really achieve full connected commerce until you've successfully deployed all of those capabilities to connect your customers through any channel that they need to order from you. So Paul, when you think about that, right? And you think about what Deloitte has done when, when you've launched these, these strategies, why do you think so many companies sort of get stuck in that 3.0 level? And, and, and what are some of those barriers that uh, keep them from progressing? Well, if you think about this whole omni-channel and it's different by industries. And so cert certain industries are a little bit ahead of the game, maybe more high tech, TMT, in the B2B space, that is. They're, they're a little bit further ahead, but you know some of the you know manufacturing, uh industrials and chemicals and oil and gas they're a little bit laggards in in some respects comparatively so they're still making these investments to drive to get some of the fundamentals out there let alone some of the higher end you know capabilities be it marketplaces e-procurement and all that so so in many ways we're just in if we use a football analogy we're just in the first quarter of the overall b2b commerce 
omni-channel uh, uh, cycle. And, you know, as you get, get that through, there's a lot to learn. And, and the biggest thing that we see is that there's not the connection. The people that are running the commercialization strategy for companies are still kind of more old school and have not understood what the lift of some of these channels can make and, and how it can um, grow. And, and this is actually something over the last year we've seen massive growth on is the changing business cases. There's some amazing business cases that are being driven by this front office and new B2B commerce channels. Excellent. Those are great points. I mean, you know, I think about um, to that point, right? Like, so that that old school strategy, when you when you look at the market, right, the total e procurement market, there's over one trillion in spend that's being trans transacted through e procurement platforms, right? But yet, when we asked some of these suppliers if they felt there was a need, six in ten report that twenty percent of their customers are asking for e procurement integration. But yet, only 30% of the suppliers are offering a procurement integration capability. So it goes to your point, Paul, of that old school mentality. And I'm not really thinking of it. And, and, and there's a lot of other things that may take precedence here. And, and the one that jumps out at me the most is we're still looking at customer call center and sales rep as, as prime places to accept orders from their customers. So do you think that that's going to start trending down as we start seeing these other, you know, capabilities and features? You mentioned marketplace, right? They're right at the top. But, you know, as e-procurement starts to grow and grow, because one trillion seems like a big number. Yeah, e even if you see like what even if you see these high numbers, I think some of them, this is a little skewed to uh, even on the higher side on the e-commerce website or marketplaces, because it might only be on proportional. Hey, I use it for a small percentage of my sales. So we're still in, like I said, in the early games. And so learning the, the whole awareness of where the benefit is. And, you know, part of what we also talk about on when we talk about B2B commerce, it's about ease of doing business. And one of the things, again, building that awareness that e the, the e-procurement integration does, it actually makes you much easier to do business with. So for example, and, and this is what's not really fully understood or how to connect to, to make it easy to break down some of those barriers is, you know, if you look at a new client that wants to connect, they might say, hey, I don't want to go have to have another login to a B2B commerce direct page. We already use our procurement system. We, I don't want to handle something else. And I have all my workflows on there. I don't want to get into something else. And so... When we've we've tested that case and also articulated these how this reduces the barriers, we've seen some of the biggest upticks be just because it's easier for them to order, and they'll come and be that those suppliers will start to leverage more just because it's they don't have to leave the system that they know and train right versus going to a separate marketplace website and login, et, et cetera. Yeah. And so I actually, I have, have something to kind of reinforce that, but I also want to, I have a question to follow up just based on that point about actually bringing it out across your organization. But first, let me just, let's talk a little bit about, you know, the success factors that you just were mentioning. So connecting and meeting your customers where they want to buy is, is actually driving growth for B2B suppliers. And it's not only driving growth with existing customers because there's increased visibility to your product offering and it's making it easier to do business with you. But it's for also new buyers, there's opportunities to get into markets you've never been in before and to meet requirements that you may not have been able to meet. And, and what we see as a result of that is we worked with uh, the Hobson and Company to kind of run an ROI study on this last year. And those that have made it easier, they're seeing the connected commerce truly in action and, and producing results. So if you look at this, this study was conducted with, you know, 15, 12 of our customers, three larger DIY players, and kind of the results are pretty amazing to me. 
And it just shows you that connecting commerce is not only providing internal operational efficiencies, but also growth, not only in new digital revenue, but with existing customers converting over. And then the interesting piece here is also the reduction in, in DSO just because of providing that, that entire procure to pay experience is also allowing your customers to pay you faster. So with all these benefits, Paul, I come back to what you just said earlier about how do I change that, that approach in my organization and how do I get buy-in to start looking at these channels? Like, what do you do when you're sitting down with a client to say, hey, we need to start looking at this e-procurement channel? Yeah, and this is where we we go back, and and so, um, in many ways, I, I'm focused around B two B commerce and those capabilities. What I actually bring is some of our industry strategists who really understand the core commercialization strategy by industry. So, for example, different industries will have different types of channels, and so, like if you look at you know go in retail, they're very high. And they're dealing with, you know, the, a lot of the retailers, one of the original, they deal with EDI all the time, right? There's not going to be, there may not be that big of an opportunity, but in other industries where they might be working with a lot of clients that have dealer channels are of certain size, that's the perfect sweet spot where procurement comes in. And so it's it's doing this matching of, hey, we've got this omni-channel set of tools where on your types of customer, what segments of your customers help. And when you start to map it out and make it real for them in the business and show them how it's part of it, that that's what really helps to connect the dots. Because as soon as you get into the segmentation strategy and like, oh yeah, we've always had an issue with that, that dealer group or that supplier group because we never gave them that tool. But at, at some of the sales leadership, they might not know that detail. And so we kind of like connect the dots from an industry and from a channel perspective. Okay. So when when you think about what we're showing here with these growth numbers, how does that compare to what you're typically seeing in, in a, you know, a commerce implementation? Yeah, it, it's, it, this is consistent. Uh, I, we've seen... Um, we, we've seen similar numbers, sometimes bigger, sometimes not quite as big, but it, it, you know, again, different industries, slightly different growth, but, um, the other piece that also doesn't get, there's hard dollars like that we show here, but some of the other things that, um, now as like, is driving many of these companies is they have to keep up. Because many of the many of their competitors are delivering these tools, and if you can't keep up, um, then they're falling back on market share. So there's a mix between growth, some internal operational pieces, but it's now become a, a almost an existential problem that hey, we've got to keep up with these guys, or we're gonna we're not gonna uh, stick around. Okay. So I want to transition a little bit to just like a, an open forum here with you. And, you know, let's, let's talk a little bit about when I think of businesses that I've come across, they, they vary in, in their maturity level. Right. And there's, there's one though, consistent theme and that's needing the proper technology to support it all. Okay. And the biggest misconception I've seen in, in B2B from a, both a distributor and manufacturer side is that many think there's this like magic eight ball that they can make all systems magically talk together and we have all the necessary features that will make their customers easily transact, right? But the most complications I see around are the backend systems that require to sort of execute an order and invoice properly across all these digital channels. So you know, when I think about the tech stack and everything that's needed behind the scenes, do you have any recommendations or suggestions on how deep I need to go into my tech stack to kind of ensure proper alignment and and what that really looks like? Yeah, and th this is actually uh, going to take a, a slight angle off of this, that one of the biggest things that's happening 
these days and we're seeing is um especially if for ERPs if if you're using SAP there is a requirement to get upgraded over the next 3 to 5 years so there's 16,000 or so SAP customers that up upgrade so it's a massive investment that needs to happen and so there's a huge investment that's going on there and what we're finding Many companies are now saying, well, if I'm going to make the investment to upgrade all my back office, I might as well look at my front office. And this is where we're seeing the biggest growth area from B2B commerce. And so one of the things I would say to look at is use that change. And when you're going to your board to get money, that's the time to maybe get some investment to also invest in these new front office tools engagement. Because what we actually found we actually found that the front office, and we have a couple of business cases here, while they were approximately like 24% of the investment actually produced close to 60% of the, the value case. So said in other ways, the new revenue growth projections and what we saw and the operational fixes consistent with what the numbers that you had helped to pay for the back office. And, and so... The, the one suggestion I would make for people that are looking at it, like, how, how do I get this paid for is, well, you know, follow follow one of those opportunities and help help to pay for your back office. That's a cool, great thing that it's one of the fastest growing areas that I've seen over the past year and a half. Okay, that's that's really helpful. And and I think that 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 ROI behind it and being able to show how you can fund it is is extremely helpful as well. So, um, OK, so. Taking that one step further, you start to hear a lot when it, there's a digital strategy around EDI, right? And and we kind of mentioned it a little bit in, in the earlier on, but EDI still continues to be a valid channel for some in B2B, um, but then others say it will be replaced soon. And there are certain technology companies out there that say EDI is old and it's, it's, it's not something that you should be working and investing in. So... What's your thoughts around that? And, and how do you leverage that into that this whole connected commerce strategy? Yeah, and, and that's why I like to talk again, beat a dead drum around omni-channel strategy around B2B yeah. because EDI is by far the biggest channel. It's the original way of electronic uh, buying and it's not going anywhere, right? Yet, I, I don't think it'll stick to the same level. It'll slowly decrease, et cetera, and eventually evolve into some form of e-procurement-like. But that's going to be over a long period of time. And, and so, again, if I go back to kind of your question around how do you look at this? Well, going back to your commercialization strategy and what's important for those segments you're just trying to make it easy to do business with. You don't want to force them, right? So if your customers or your suppliers are saying, we're only EDI and that's it, well, you, you go along and you support it, right? But I think the opportunity is, you know, focus to make it easier with all your different segments. Okay, great. So you think about um, the, the, I guess the change management aspect of that, right? So some are resistant to change, some aren't. Some will be like, hey, I'll look at EDI and, 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 and think that how can it take me to the future and others not. So how do you factor in the change management piece into this type of a strategy? And, and how does the change management impact sort of like a, a successful timeline to deploy a, this type of strategy? Yeah, so... Uh, um. Well what I've seen in more of the change management challenge, it hasn't been necessarily versus other channels. It's more of like, how do you bring kind of the sales team along, right? How do you make them part of the solution and give them incentives? So th the worst thing that you can do is create a channel. You want to push your clients to, but then don't incentivize your salespeople, right? They're part of the channel. They know their customers, right? And so if you also make sure that they're part of the process, they give input, they help you understand your customers better, but you also tell make sure that their sales and bonuses are tied to leveraging some of these tools, that'll help in adoption massively. 
And, and also listening to your customers on when you listening to your salespeople um, as part of this building out these channels is super key. It's the you know number one thing from a change management perspective I've learned in the B2B world. So how often do you feel sales is included when you're developing a strategy? Because I can tell you from, from my experience, I feel like they're kind of left on the outside and there's not a lot, they're not involved in the decision-making process. And to your point at the last minute, they're saying, Hey, this is what you got to go do. And this is how you have to change. So when do you feel that they, I know you'd probably say at the beginning, but in your experience, when has sales become involved in these types of discussions? Yeah, so a couple of what we do at Deloitte. One, we have a lot of industry experts that we, we bring in that worked at Deloitte, has worked at some of these clients already and kind of get their input and seed it in. And then when we started our workshops, we really insist on getting not only um, voice of the customer, which is also employee, some of the suppliers, et cetera, but also the voice of the uh, sales team, et cetera to make sure that they're part of it. And so I think at minimum, getting them part of the workshops to drive the requirements and really hear about, you know, what what is the biggest pain point? Is it, do I get my order status? Is it get my payments or is pricing the more? It really helps to give the context because then you can prioritize to, to really, you know, build that ad adoption. Okay. Awesome. Um, I, I, I feel like sales is, is ultimately, you know, holds the keys to, to really drive full on engagement endorsement and, and conversion into this entire strategy, especially in those digital channels. So, um, so let me ask you a question. So taking into consideration everything that we've discussed so far, uh, when you're building your, your digital omni-channel strategy, you know, it's important to factor e-procurement, but, you know, I guess, what would you say are like the three takeaways that someone or three steps that someone listening today should start looking at to begin to incorporate not only e-procurement into their omni-channel strategy, but also just to, to start building an effective digital omni-channel strategy? Well, first, first, um, educate your leadership. It's going to take a long time. I, I swear I have the same presentation that I give over and over and over just because these are all new terms to people, right? And so explaining how B2B commerce is not just all, it's not just like Amazon. It's not just like this commerce thing over there. It's all of these things and it's real money. And, and you understand what that is. So first thing, get the basics, educate, 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 and then, they'll start to click in, especially when all of a sudden leadership needs to make, you know, drive new revenue. They're like, oh, okay, what? Do, there's opportunities. So that's number one. Number two is you need to build the fundamental uh, building blocks, right? And the, the, the number one step in, in the building blocks in the whole omni-channel is you need a core B2B commerce engine really to help coordinate and sell and connect the dots on all these things. And so, Really, you know, starting to through the maturity and building that out because you're going to need that for marketplaces. You're going to need it for procurement. You're going to need it across the board. And then third, a after you have the basics and the people that understand and aligned is what we're seeing. And we're doing this with a lot of our customers is uh, the e-procurement channel for s many types of uh, industries is the fastest growing area and, and so really looking at that segmentation strategy and how you can grow there because it for those types of customers it's going to be the easiest way for them to order and that's really what the goal of what you're trying to do okay well i appreciate that and i and i have i have questions based on those those three statements before we open it up for questions i just i just want to Double click on a couple of things. So educate your leadership, right? Um, when when you talk about that, I, I just want to give you a quick example and and tell me how you how you address something like this. So I've heard from from a friend in the industry that 
whose whose company is actually has a really good strategy, and yet they still struggle with driving e procurement, even though e procurement is a high revenue generating channel. Okay, but it just feels like the leadership is still not on board. They're not bought into the fact that e, -pro e procurement is a revenue driver. Is there anything else that that you would suggest that? How do you get leadership over the hump that that shows that you know these things aren't going away, right? This channel is growing. You know, I've heard some statements like, "Hey, X Y Z systems, they won't be around long enough. You know, they'll be replaced by some other way of of ordering, right?" And and everybody talks about AI. So, is there any other tips that you could say that I should look at to educate my leadership, even if I already have it in place today? What else could I do? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, when we're looking at different industries, the, the thing that I would be scared of, uh, of a lot of different companies, there's new entrants in marketplaces that are looking to take out so that if you're not providing, and, and this is many times, uh, another tool is the, the scare factor. And it's a real scare factor. There's a lot of Wow. vertical marketplaces, B2B marketplaces that didn't exist, that you wouldn't have thought. Like there's there's two or three major chemical marketplaces, who would have thought, right? That are disrupt, distributing the, uh, the, 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 the commonplace. And so what up, that is like also a, a, a big deal of like looking at what's up and coming and coming out of there. But then- Again, I think you got to tie it back to your segments, segmentation strategy, and like using um, the more that you can use it from in language from the business and the metrics that drive them. So what you have to find out is, you know, based on that industry, what are the what is the priorities? Is it around profitability? Is it around growth? And then target those segments to to tell that story. Okay, great, great points. I like that. Um, okay, so second point around the core B two B commerce engine. So again, like your thoughts on is there specific ones I should be looking at? Is there core functionality that you know I need to be offering? Because again, I look at back at my experience in in different um, distribution companies and. There was a core set of features and functionalities that we offered that then once you connected in e-procurement, you extended that out to your procurement customer. So is there any suggestions or recommendations around that when you're thinking about a, a B2B commerce engine? Well, first of all, understand B2B commerce is very different than B2C commerce, right? And, and so what we're seeing is when we're, Many times when we're focusing on the B2B commerce, we're doing a whole, we actually talk about uh, upgrading the whole front office. So it might be sales, commerce, service, marketing. It's kind of all inter, inter um, weave together versus like, you know, if you were just selling uh, on B2C, that's a whole other channel you buy it, you're done. You really have to be integrated into the sales data and the opportunity management and how that clicks in. And so, you know, first thing you have to make sure that um, you're looking at a tool that easily integrates with all things front office. So that's, you know, number one, number two, really looking at for whatever type of uh, business, all the different types of catalogs that you need to support pricing um, different pricing mechanisms and that that make it a little bit more complicated. But the last thing in just getting started in, in some companies, one of the things that we've done to start with is just start with an order portal, right? The, because it's all about how do you do, make it easier to do business with and you bring people along. And what we found is... You know, maybe you just start small, give them a portal, they start to learn and engage, and that helps to then get the ball rolling. And so that's another tactic of start small, get some excitement, and then when they hear it, they'll 
they'll drive out and really, you know, build up kind of like down the hill and understand the whole benefits of omni-channel. Okay, that makes sense. So then last one I have is for focusing on the e-procurement channel. And you talk about segmentation strategy. And this is another area. And, and in our previous conversations, I think you've used the term, uh, it's not a set it and forget it type technology. And I use the, it's not an if you build it, they will come. So when you talk about segmentation, how deep do you need to go into that? Is it is it persona building? Is it industry specific? Like what can you elaborate a little bit more on that segmentation strategy? Yeah, sure. Um, so when we're talking about segmentation strategy, it's kind of more of like thinking from an industry perspective, like do I have my SMB clients? Do I have a bunch of little dealers, right? Is it, are my dealers like I have three big dealers that I have to that do 70% of my business and then I have a thousand that do the rest. And so kind of chopping that up and figuring out what what's most important and prioritizing then. And when you have that, what we're finding is what's interesting, the sweet spot for procurement, it seems to be almost like that your top many of your top massive vendors are using EDI. And, you know, playing around on some of their units might be using a procurement, but the ones in the middle, those are companies that are big enough to have like a Cooper or Reba, um, but they don't want to have to use a website, right, to, to use for B2B commerce. And so that sweet spot in the middle seems to be where e-procurement is kind of the sweet spot for them. Whereas kind of like if you have a segmentation where you're doing your your customers you're selling to mom and pop or smaller businesses that they haven't gone up and started to use kind of a, a, a more formal procurement system that they are better suited to like direct B2B commerce. Okay. And the more you can make it easy for those middle ones, I think the more they're inclined to buy more from you because you're making it easier, right? It, it, exactly. It's kind of a fortuitous circle there. Excellent. All right. Well, I appreciate all of that uh, expertise and insight and and really the the three key pieces there. And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience and, um, you know, see what uh, what else we have. And so if you again, just to remind everybody, use the Q&A in the chat um, and submit your questions. We have some already queued up. So, uh, Paul, I'm going to start with uh, the first one. So um, do you have any additional tips to convince a sales team to focus on digital or e-commerce or e-procurement? Yeah, so um, I, I think the other piece that, again, looking at and when making these investments, like from from our understanding is one is again, looking at um, not just holistically, like also thinking about other tools. So when we talk about commerce, we also talk about CPQ might be part of it. Like, cause that's part, part of that whole sales uh, alignment. And so one of the things that we've also helped to do is like, it's really hard sometimes to like push commerce agreements in if you already have sales agreements in with some of your customers. And so a one way to build adoption is make some of your pricing strategy improvements by leveraging these tools. So for example, hey, if you use our e-procurement system, you're going to get your best dollars because we don't have to have manual handlers, et cetera. And so, and, and or just for if you have the power to force to your suppliers you can use that negotiation up front to kind of drive them to that and so those are the ways that we've seen to kind of drive adoption excellent i like that idea i i like the fact of hey taking me to that right channel and i'm going to give you the best price because it's the lowest cost to serve for me yep um okay so uh, another question came up, and it's um, from an e-procurement perspective, 
Do you have a sense for what percent of the 16,000 legacy SAP organizations that you had mentioned um, would likely be utilizing e-procurement functions such as SAP, Ariba, or Coupa? Uh, uh, first of all, I, I think <laughs> most will go to some form of some commerce for sure. Um, and I think there's a, I, I know there's a large percentage that will be upgrading their front office at the same time. And, and so I think that's going to be a catalyst. And, and again, I've literally over the last two years, this is what's driving it all is that if they don't have some of these tools, it's become, well, it's like you're redoing your house, right? You pull together. It's like, you're going to take over the first floor, upgrade it all. But then the top floor, you haven't done anything. Well, if we're going to get all this expense to get people in, we might as well finish the whole house. And really, we, we think this will be the, this upgrade path will be the biggest change agent to really drive the, the technology in the B2B space. Okay. It's helpful. Uh, next question is, how do you see the role marketplaces play in being utilized for procurement related functions versus outwardly with customers? Yeah. And, and in many ways, um, marketplaces aren't that different from just your core B2B commerce. What they've done is people have taken advantage to, they've invested ahead of the game and have made it brought others along and made it easier for customers to buy either um, focused area products. They can go one place, one stop to shop, right? And so they only have to figure out one place to work. And, and so this is where the lines between marketplaces, procurement, third parties, your own marketplace, it's gonna it's gonna blur a lot. And and so the opportunity for those that can have our forward thinking, they're building out some of these marketplaces so that they can control the spend. And if you control the spend, even if it's not all going directly to you, you're building that relationship, right? And that's a lot of what, if you look at Amazon, why it's so many of the ways that they're so successful. If you look at online, even from the B2C or B2B, all their other services is what they're making money on. They're they make more money off of their media network now on ads served up than they do from their core commerce. And, and so the, the analogy to B2B is it's still early days there. So there's a lot of people trying to fight to own the B2B marketplaces in each of their segments. And so it's a massive opportunity for the, the most aggressive. And tactically, it's also a tactical one. So if you already got your base commerce, you got your e-procurement, hey, how, how do I add on my own? Just let's extend out. So it could be an extension strategy. Like, hey, when our customers want to buy, we provide 70% of their, their products to build X. Well, let's partner with these other guys and we'll give the other 30%. They only have to deal with us. Right. And, and so there's a lot of permutations of what could happen, but it's a it's a great, powerful tool. It's interesting because if you think about it, marketplaces are, you know, sometimes they're external, which the external marketplaces like an Amazon business, they do have punch out. Right. They do punch out from an Ariba and a Coupa. But then you also have some of these other companies that are building, like you mentioned, marketplaces to try to address a certain proportion of spend and make sure that it's consistent across their all their entire organization. So it seems to be like there's a, it's going in a lot of different directions and and eventually you'll start to see over the course of the next couple of years more clarity around which direction is going to win out. Yeah. Okay. Um I have there's a question I think it's probably towards me because it's about the slide I presented. Can you clarify what is meant by the 60% reduction in IT time implementing e-procurement integrations? How? Um, so I can talk about that and, and Paul, you can add in any color if you want, but basically the, the study that we conducted around IT time saved in, in doing e-procurement, it's really when, when they utilized a, a third 
party or a outsource to someone like a trade center, right? Because basically leveraging our platform and the reconnection capabilities and the ability to not have to redo over and over every unique map and every unique integration to every one of your customers and to leverage some of that same technology reduces not only the time and effort, but also reduces the ongoing maintenance and update and support that you would have to dedicate and staff towards doing some of those activities. So that's kind of what's meant by that, that reduction time. And Paul, I don't know if you have any anything to add around, you know, what do you, if you see anything when it comes to IT with utilizing other services outside of them building it all in-house? I, th I think you've got it covered. You're the expert in this space. Uh, yeah. I agree with what you said. Perfect. All right. Um, next question it looks like, again, for me, in Kevin, in your past, what have you experienced to be the most effective in connecting the omni-channel strategy across the organization? Well, that seems to be a loaded question. Um, I, I look at that most effective is being able to, to, to prove out, and I think some of the things that Paul mentioned earlier, to be able to prove out the ROI, right? And to be able to prove out what you're generating from your connections. So I've, I've had to experience at multiple companies and we had different requirements in each. And one, we said that you had to be at least a $10,000 a month customer to be integrated. And then the other, we said, you don't need to be any minimums, we'll take anyone. And what we found was when we put a restriction in, we were kind of really taking this closed view of the world. But when we opened it up, we were able to say, well, I just took a customer that was doing $5,000 and I grew them to 500,000 because I connected them. I offered them additional solutions. They bought more categories. They saw my pricing. They saw my availability. So those types of things and, and, and putting that all together and being able to pitch that up the ladder, up to the senior leadership and say, this is what this channel is driving from a revenue perspective, from a customer retention perspective, and also from a customer acquisition perspective. I think really helps with that entire strategy. Yeah, I'll just add, hey, Kevin, just to add on that, because I think you have an important thing, right? Like it would be short-sighted. It's just like, well, these customers haven't gone through this threshold and then you just prioritize. Well, there may be a reason these others. And so I, I know an interesting way that we've seen that we've helped some of the other, our other customers is we've actually looked at some of their potential customers and also mapped out if they have some of these other procurement tools and what potentially we could um, and the types of companies that they are and kind of score them, right? And that's what's actually helped to get con convincing because then you have like more of a real case. Like if you find, hey, we haven't really done that much business with these four companies, but they have these tools so the propensity to switch, if you make it easy, it, it is there. That's that's a great point. I was I was talking to a a customer recently that sells a product that typically typically gets installed by some installation based type of contractors, but there are certain areas that they buy these products themselves and they install it in in house. And when I started looking at at their their customers, one question I had was how come you don't have college and universities on this list? Because typically they have an in-house maintenance staff that does a lot of their installs. And, you know, the light bulb went on because they were, they right away, they said, wow, you know, we thought about that, but we didn't really think of how deep it was. And I said, well, hey, there are some specific e-procurement verticals out there that are easy to connect to that you, if you offered punch out and, and connected to them, you'd have amazing growth opportunity. So it's it's to your point, Paul, just looking at those other areas where there could be potential that maybe you didn't want to go before, but e-procurement also allows that ease of entry. All right. And I think the last question we have here is if I have, and I think this is probably for you, Paul, if I have the core B2B e-commerce base offering and I may have the potential to integrate some of my customers. What is it really I should be doing next in my strategy? Like, am I, am I looking to outsource? Am I looking to sell this upwards? 
what are what are kind of the next steps I should be following? Yeah, it, it's a good question. And it, it's actually kind of what I just talked about is really doing your pace around your target clients, like what what they're looking for, if they have the tools, your segmentation like this, you know, if you're trying to grow and many of your customers are, you know, let's say less than a million dollars or less than five to 10 million, right? They may, there's no, they may not have those tools or the investments on, but if your segment is between certain pieces is really understanding that segments and, and kind of mapping that through and, and telling that case. So, so that's one. Or two, looking at how do you, as part of a product launch or a segment that might be hot, how do you test out some tools to really see, hey, is this going to work? Because that's another, because too many times people try and, we want to convert everything and do it all. But instead, if you start with a small segment that you want to show what is the potential that's another technique to really help bring people along and help get leadership aligned to then make a bigger investment down the road. That's a really good point. Um, and I feel like focusing on a specific segment, a target segment, and and really seeing that through definitely can build you some a really good business case to help sell it throughout not only the organization, but also upward. So um, great, great answer. And then, uh, like and then just, just the one thing I would add, and this is something that we're now seeing is then um, in, in kind of the opposite of the set it and forget it. Then once you get on there is then making sure that you set up the center of excellence that knows how to then bring people on, right? Like how do we then facilitate to make it easier to add the next dealer, the next supplier, right? Like in all of those. And that's, critical in kind of the, the the maintaining of the growth. Yeah, that's extremely important. And it's a, it's a great probably final point too, because I feel like that underscores everything is you have this strategy and you implement it, but you also need some of the people to execute it and keep it ongoing and growing, right? Yeah, and, and then that's, that's normally the number one, right? Like again, the difference between kind of commerce, and this is some of the times the challenge when you're selling to, you know, leadership in IT, they're used to, well, I, I did a, a service implementation, I capture it, it's done, right? You don't invest. No, no, but when you, this is your selling, this is your external to your customer, you want to keep investing and growing because it's growth. So it's a little, it's different than your back office uh, investments and, and and sometimes that gets lost depending on who owns the investment um, for that solution. Yep, great point. All right, well, I think uh, that's the last question. Um, so, with that said, Paul, I would really like to thank you for joining us today. I, this has been great conversation. Um, I, I I feel like. I learned a lot too. Not only I know we did some some pre pre conversation, but just some of the new information that you brought out is extremely helpful. I feel like you know when we, when we think about the the three pieces that that the three steps basically that I should take, whether it's educate my leadership and then you know start with that core B two B commerce engine and then look at e procurement and your segmentation strategy. I think those three takeaways should be helpful for a lot to to really you know, start to build out that strategy. And if they already built it, to continue to enhance. And so again, I wanna thank you again for your time today. I appreciate you joining us. Um, yeah, th and thanks so much. Th thanks so much, I, I enjoyed it. I, I'm a B2B commerce geek, so I could go on talking about this, but for anybody else that's out there, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn, Paul DeForno, or at, on Twitter slash X at DeForno P. Excellent. And same thing, if you have any questions, follow up, you can hit us up at Trade Centric or you can uh, also hit me up uh, on LinkedIn as well. And um, Melissa, I will turn it over to you to close us out. Yes. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Kevin. And thank you, everybody, for joining. 
please be on the lookout for details regarding our next trade centric university masterclass in the new year. We wish you and yours a wonderful holiday season. Bye everyone.